So hello, good afternoon and welcome to what is sadly the last day of uh, UK Hydrogen Week 2023 at, here at Brunel University. Um, this is the fifth and final webinar in this series on thinking differently in hydrogen. Um, and I'm your host, uh, Alexander Reap, Brunel University's Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence. Um, each day we have had a presentation from a Brunel expert on a specific topic, followed by a talk from an SME who are developing technology to support the growth of the UK's hydrogen economy. Now, if you stay tuned to the end, I'll give um, a slight update on what's going to be happening after this series, um, as we've had very good uptake from it, and we are looking to sort of continue in various ways. So do stay tuned for that. And before we fully start the day, um, a few housekeeping points to mention. Um, firstly, all of these webinars um, have been recorded, um, and this one included. Um, so if that is an issue, then do please drop off now. Um, once this series is finished, we will be putting all of these videos up on Brunel's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and so you can sort of rewatch any that you may have missed. Um, after the two talks we have today, we will also be having a Q&A session. So do feel free to type into the chat um, bar of Zoom any questions that you might have. Um, and if you do want to ask, ask your questions in person, um, when we get to that part of the session, please do raise your hand and I'll endeavour to try and um, make sure I, I notice you. Um, and up until that point, also please do keep your microphones muted and just to make sure that the speakers um, don't get distracted. Um, so, so far we've had a really great week of talks on all manner of subjects relating to hydrogen, from living labs and combustion to the general policy and alternatives to electrolysis. Um, and today we're focusing on an area which in some ways we've really touched on um, every day and is an area where there's a lot of new innovations that are, are coming through. Um, and of course that topic is uh, hydrogen storage and transportation. Um, it's a very important area and it sort of shows how important it is that Innovate UK, the UK sort of innovation arm, um, has also announced a new competition um, that sort of came out last, yesterday in fact on hydrogen storage and transport, um, looking to sort of bring collaborate, bring collaborations together um, to be able to sort of to try and help um, innovate in this space. Um, we've heard a lot about it already, as I mentioned. So on Monday, we talked about the wider issues of storing and transporting large quantities of gaseous hydrogen. And yesterday, Stuart McKnight from SWISO um, made the point on how at the moment, um, hydrogen production uh, systems are distributed in, in small but large, small um, but large, sorry, a small amount of large plants all over the UK um, and that this may cause issues with the distribution of hydrogen to specific industries. Um, one way to sort this out, he mentioned, was actually to create a small, a, a network of smaller distribution, a smaller production systems that can be distributed to a specific point, um, which is a very interesting way to look at the problem. But why, why are we going to be having so many issues? considering that we have a large sort of gas um, network already in place. Well, we've mentioned hydrogen brittlement is a very big issue that's coming along, that's coming along, that is known in um, all sorts of the normal materials and metallic materials that are used in, uh, in the distribution network that we have, as well as um, in other storage medium. Um, and so how, how do we see this and how can we uh, sort of detect against this? Um, and sort of show that even, even high and, and well-known materials that are used in very nasty um, applications such as the oil and gas sector as it is, um, still have issues with this hydrogen brittlement, which we will be noticeable if we're starting to put quantities of hydrogen gas into the gas network. Um, and so this is really where our talks are going today. So we have uh, two talks um, on transport and storage. Um, our first talk from Michael White, um, who's a doctoral student at Brunel University in the Department for Mechanical Engineering and Aerospace. And his PhD is in partnership with TWI. Uh, he's, in, he's done his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, where he's developed a keen interest in materials science. And this led to his PhD studying hydrogen brittlement in duplex stainless steels. So Michael, I will give the floor to you. Yeah. Hello. I am Michael White, a first year PhD student affiliated with NSERC, and this is my presentation on the use of duplex stainless steel in the hydrogen industry. <clears throat> Before I get started, I'd like to do a brief outline of what I'll be covering. I'll just be starting with a brief introduction on duplex stainless steels, their uses, how hydrogen embrittlement affects them, how their diffusion properties can affect hydrogen embrittlement, the crystal structure of duplex stainless steels, 
how deformation can affect their crystal structure and their ability to absorb hydrogen. The aims of our investigation that I'll be conducting into duplex stainless steels along with our investigation methodology, the numerical model that I've been working on and our future work and our immediate next steps. Duplex stainless steels are a very modern type of steel having only surfaced in the 1980s. You can see their structure on the images on the right in the electron microscope images present displaying the ferrite grain structure with austenite islands present throughout. As mentioned on this slide, ferrite makes up up to about 70% of GPEX stainless steel structure, although ideally GPEX stainless steels are usually approximately 50% austenite and 50% ferrite. GPEX stainless steels were created uh, to combine the hardness of ferrite with the corrosion resistance and ductility of austenite, mainly for use in things like the subsea industry for use in hydrogen. Duplex stainless steels are frequently used in the subsea oil industry during construction, such as for the bolts in the image on the right, which have uh, been broken down by hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, duplex stainless steels during construction are often welded to carbon steels, which inherently results in the occurrence of cathodic protection. The cathodic protection which occurs creates hydrogen through reduction reactions at the surface of the metal, which then permeates into and diffuses through the duplex stainless steels. Uh, this very much shows that cathodic protection is not a very good method for, for preventing the hydrogen embrittlement, uh, and in fact causes it and makes it significantly worse, which very much brings me on to um, talking about hydrogen embrittlement and diffusion of hydrogen within duplex stainless steels. Hydrogen embrittlement is defined as the loss in ductility created by the permeation and diffusion of hydrogen into a material surface. As shown in the image on the right, during hydrogen embrittlement, hydrogen concentrates in voids and defects present in a material and causes those voids to expand perpendicular to the direction of the stress applied. This results in a loss in material ductility and strength in the direction of stress. None of that would be accomplished without the methods of diffusion within DSSs, which allows hydrogen to diffuse through their crystal structure. <clears throat> Vacancy and interstitial diffusion are the most common methods of diffusion in metallic structures, shown in the images on the right, with vacancy diffusion in the top image and interstitial diffusion on the bottom image. Um, as shown by experiments conducted for the Internal International Journal of Hydrogen Energy, Rate of diffusion can be calculated using Arrhenius equations. During the experiments they conducted, they calculated diffusion rate for different crystal structures and showed that body centered cubic structures and um, experience significantly higher rates of diffusion than face centered cubic structures, which is significantly important because face centered cubic structures and body centered cubic structures make up the duplex structure of duplex stainless steel which represents the relevance of crystal structure within hydrogen and hydrogen transport or containment. So as I just mentioned, both FCC or face center cubic and BCC body center cubic structures were tested during the experiments. FCC structures make up austenite and BCC structures make up ferrite. FCC structures are shown to have significantly more closely packed atomic structure than body center cubics, represented by their atomic packing factor of 0.74, which is the highest possible atomic packing factor that can be achieved for the crystal structure. Atomic packing factor represents the percentage of a unit cell which is occupied by the hard spheres shown in the image on the right. The densely packed structure of austenite is what causes the slower diffusion rate within its structure and creates a tortuous path for hydrogen, which mainly transports through the, fer the ferrite phase of duplex stainless steel, avoiding the austenite islands, which can act as hydrogen sinks. This gives duplex stainless steels a resistance to hydrogen embrittlement, giving them a significant advantage for processes involving hydrogen. However, this resistance to hydrogen transport can be altered by deformation of the duplex stainless steel crystal structure. Increased stress 
results in the two methods of defamation shown in the right hand image, slip and twinning. Any form of defamation changes the crystal structure and can result in voids and defects becoming present for hydrogen to diffuse through via vacancy diffusion, decreasing the resistance to hydrogen embrittlement. For duplex stainless steels, further testing is still required on hydrogen embrittlement, which leads me on to the experiments this project will aim to complete to further our understanding of hydrogen embrittlement. This project aims to investigate the effects hydrogen embrittlement has on the fracture toughness of duplex stainless steels, while also investigating the initiation of the crack formation. A combination of numerical simula simulations and experiments will be conducted, starting with a 3D bending, three point bending test with a notch integrated. Notches are noted as a stress concentrator which will allow us to assess the point of initiation of crack forming by limiting the area at which a crack could occur. <clears throat> During our testing, an FEA model will be utilised to find an optimised notch geometry for testing, as changing the notch's width and depth will alter the effect it has on the stress concentration at the notch tip. A notch which is too wide or too narrow will not provide the correct stress concentration to assess the crack formation. The wider a notch is, the lower the stress concentration at the notch tip. Once physical testing of the duplex stainless steel begins, optical and electron microscopy will be used for 2D characterization of our metal specimens. The location of crack, in, crack initiation and the stress required to initiate the crack formation will be determined using acoustic emissions testing. And the ultimate aim of our project will be to create a unified testing methodology for fracture toughness in hydrogen enriched environments. <clears throat> as I just mentioned, testing will begin with a three point bending model, such as the one above, which was made in Abacus. The model will be used to analyze the effects of changing notch geometries within the model to find an optimum notch geometry for physical testing by testing multiple notch geometries and assessing how they affect the maximum stress at the notch tip. Further development of the model to include hydrogen permeation will likely be actualized through examining the internal strain created by hydrogen embrittlement and incorporating the reduced ductility and strength into the model's calculations. As for our future work and our immediate next steps, the immediate next step in our projects are as follows. The further development to the FEA model, which was just discussed, will lead to an optimized notch geometry for physical testing. That will then lead us on to microscopic analysis of the sample structure to assess the distribution of austenite islands in the ferrite grain structure. Finally, our physical testing will begin, including bending and, including bending and tension testing. So as a brief summary, we've concluded through research that duplex stained steels are a high strength, ductile and corrosion resistant material, ideal for use within the hydrogen and in the subsea industry, particularly in the oil industry due to their resistance to hydrogen embrittlement. Despite their resistance to hydrogen embrittlement, Hydrogen embrittlement still occurs in hydrogen rich environments, particularly in the case of cathodic protection, which causes additional production of hydrogen at the material surface via reduction reactions. Hydrogen embrittlement is heavily influenced by crystal structure, with austenite having high resistance to hydrogen transport due to its closely packed structure. This high resistance can, however, be influenced by deformation altering the crystal structure and creating voids of hydrogen diffusion leading to fracture. The ultimate aim of this project is to produce an effective and accurate methodology for testing fracture toughness in duplex stainless steels, as many of the methods currently available for testing fracture toughness uh, do not create um, an accurate enough result to be used within industrial applications. If you would like to do any further reading on the subject, please refer to my reference list. And thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Michael. Really interesting sort of to, to see the, 
the differences in what uh, what superduplex can do and how it can be sort of used in these areas, potentially be used in these areas. Um, so moving on, um, we discussed yesterday how, of course, gaseous hydrogen isn't really the only way that you can uh, you sort of store the hydrogen that you're producing using any of these number of uh, production methods. Of course, one of the other ways you can do it is, is as liquid hydrogen. Now, of course, this raises challenges not only in, um, in the energy needed for compression to get it to this, um, but also in where really the end use cases could justify the, the increased energy needed to, to create this. Um, and we were discussing yesterday that one of the main areas for this could be in the aerospace sector. Um, and with us today is Stephen Kyle Hemi from TISIX, who are a, a, a composite materials company who are using their knowledge in advanced composite materials to develop and look into new storage systems for liquid hydrogen, specifically focused on the aerospace sector. So Stephen, I will leave over to you. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, brilliant. So uh, my name is Stephen Carpenny. I'm Managing Director and Founder of Tie 6 Limited. Um, so as, as Alex said, we're looking at how you, you get hydrogen and liquid hydrogen into uh, the aerospace sector. Um, I have a, uh, a presentation that hopefully will come up now. Can you, can you all see this? Yeah, we can see it in um, in PowerPoint mode. Um, I don't know if you want to use that or turn it into presentation mode. It should go into there. We go presentation. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Right. So Tysix Ty uh, specialises in um, lightweight metal matrix composites. So little tube you see on the on the drawing, little tube I'm I'm waving in the air here weighs about thirty five grams, same as a packet of crisps, um, but will carry five metric tons, which is the same as a an African elephant or two Indian elephants. Um, so this lightweight metal composite technology gives us a huge advantage in aerospace for a number of components and, and, and therefore CO2 emission reduction from static parts. But using that technology combined with some of our space technology gives a real opportunity to support getting um, hydrogen into aviation as a fuel. And, and that's a real zero emission rather than net zero um, uh, which is, is, is fantastic for the, for the sector. Um, so liquid hydrogen is very challenging. All the issues that, that have just been mentioned in terms of hydrogen embrittlement um, in, in, uh, in, in metals and other materials, it is also very challenging because liquid hydrogen is cryogenic, minus 250 odd degrees C, so very difficult to handle in most materials. Um, and that really leads us to um, a, a number of challenges to address however you use liquid hydrogen and wherever you use it. Um, it has to be a metal that won't be damaged, and that really leads you to stainless steels, as mentioned before, or aluminium. Um, aluminium is, is obviously the preferred choice for an aviation sector because it's so much lighter. Um, but Aluminium isn't as strong as, as, as stainless steel, um, so you have to do some, some novel things to make use of it. So for aviation, there are, there are a number of particularly unique challenges compared to a hydrogen economy elsewhere. Um, mass and volume are absolutely critical. This, these tanks of, of liquid hydrogen will probably be within the fuselage. That means less passengers, less payload, um, and therefore less economic case for, for flight. So you have to do something to keep them as small as possible. You need to maximize the amount of fuel that you get for the mass of tank that you have. So whilst gaseous hydrogen is really, really good because it's, it's reasonably easy to handle, it's very high pressure, very heavy tanks to contain that pressure safely. Liquid hydrogen, much thinner wall tanks, but obviously the issues with cryogenics. Um, you need to be able to make these at a high rate. You know, these are big tanks. You know, we've seen designs for five meter by three meter tanks. They're huge. And you need to be able to produce a lot of them. Um, Airbus are producing between 60 and 80 A320 aircraft a month, you know, 600 plus a year. Boeing are doing the same with the, a, with the 737. And then you've got all the bigger twin aisle aircraft. So a lot of planes to supply tanks for. So they need a high production rate tank. Um, you need to be able to attach these things into the aircraft. And there's all sorts of things like stopping the, the liquid hydrogen sloshing around when you take off and land because that change in mass would have a real impact on center of gravity of an aircraft. Um, 
the pressures are fairly low. So for liquid hydrogen, it's only about five bar. But you've got all the stresses of vibration on takeoff and landing and stresses within the aircraft that have to be taken by the tank or loaded away from the tank. So you need a strong tank as well. And these things are likely to be fitted for a 20 year life of an aircraft. So fatigue is a real issue and a, a particular challenge with aluminium. So there, there's some significant issues there. And then there's a the big question about, do you foam insulate it? Simple, relatively cheap, um, but quite bulky. Or can you look at a vacuum seal, much more complicated, but much uh, lower volume. So it has benefits there. So TISIX has been very fortunate with a, with a consortium, including M. Wright and Sons, University of Dar Derby and Oxico uh, in Oxford to win a, a program to look at technologies for lightweight tanks in aerospace for aviation use. Um, it's about a two year program due to finish um, September next year, where we'll look at all of the technologies required. And what we're aiming to do is reduce the mass, get get the, the tank as small and as light as possible, increase you know, capacity for the for the um, fuel inside, the hydrogen inside relative to insulation and structural loads. Keep production routes short. How can we make that tank near net shape to get it really quick and reduce the amount of machining or waste if you were to use large forgings? Um, we can put anti-slosh features in and other features where we diffusion bond the parts on, and I'll, I'll come on to that later. Um, and also structural supports to allow it to have a very high fatigue life needed for that, that high long life aircraft use. Um, and we're working to look at can we make a twin wall tank with a vacuum in it to give that real um, low volume solution that, that aerospace need. And, and largely from our point of view, create a UK supply chain. Let's get this technology manufactured, designed, design, developed, qualified and supplied from the UK um, rather than uh, elsewhere. Um, so we've got some really, really clever materials within TIE-6. Um, they're about twice the specific stiffness and strength of conventional metals um, through, through our reinforcement. That's where we combine a ceramic fiber, silicon carbide or alumina into aluminium or titanium or um, uh, alloys to give a very, very much higher strength and stiffness. And the, and the materials on properties on the right show that we can you know, for aluminium, we're about four times the strength of a really good aluminium, um, similar density, a little bit higher some um, than that. Um, and we can significantly reduce the thermal expansion below that of, of, of aluminium. And that's important um, when you think that your temperature range um, could be plus 50 degrees C to minus 250 degrees C. It's quite a quite a change there um, in, in properties. And, and uh, this is where our material has unique capabilities for this application. Um, how do we make it? We make silicon carbide fiber in, in our factory in Farnborough. We can wind that fiber, despite the fact it's a ceramic, we can get enough flex in it to wind it into different shapes. We've got a technology that allows us to filament wind by pre-coating the, uh, the fiber with aluminium, in this case, or titanium. We encapsulate it into a near net shape mold and hot isostatic um, pressing to diffusion bond and combine the fiber and the aluminium and any other features to give us a matrix that is, um, is, is a uniform distribution of our fiber in there. And as I say, net, net shaped parts, as you can see. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking simple components um, such as the domes, adding our reinforcement where we need it and diffusion bonding that together to make a, a full tank and, and very simplistically shown on, on that slide. Um, but we can do much more complex things. So this, this part here, which you can see on the left-hand side, is, is actually made as a single piece. The bases come out because we have to put a diaphragm in there, two tanks and a, a gas fill tank. So we can do clever things with tanks, which you wouldn't be able to do by conventional manufacturing without lots of welds and other, other potential problems. So this tank here, um, which is, is the one in the middle picture, has tabs machine a uh, diffusion bonded on the inside so we don't machine it we don't waste so much material really critical to get costs down and production efficiencies up so we're not wasting material um, with all the, the the entrained co2 that that would that would um, uh, deliver and the other clever things that we can do is to put mixed metals together so for the um for the, the middle image you can see here and, and the tank i'm just holding up 
that's for hydrogen peroxide, another fuel that's been considered. Um, that has pure aluminium down the inside, something that doesn't react, won't react with liquid hydrogen, and then high strength um, aluminium alloys around the outside, all bonded together as a single, uh, well, I'll say homogeneous, single component. And we can do the same with stainless steel, joining that to aluminium and titanium. This is important because the pipe work out of these tanks needs to go into pipe work into the rest of the aircraft structure. And what we can really do, which is, is, is pretty, pretty unique, is make very thin wall structures in one go. So this tank here um, is about 0.4 millimeter wall thickness. It'll need to be thicker for structural loads, not pressure loads for a liquid hydrogen tank. So the, the aim is that we use our technologies to really decarbonize um, aviation. It's a really challenging thing. More people want to fly. We've got more international connected connectivity through air um, aviation. Really, really important for economies, really important for people to get around and see each other. Um, and, and those technologies need lightweight materials. Um, hydrogen is the ultimate fuel for aircraft. Um, batteries would be great, but you're going to need a lot of batteries to get you across the Atlantic, whereas you could do it conceivably with hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is a few years away, but we are working now to deliver the tanks that allow us to store that and take that to the next level. And then ultimately future optimized designs such as blended wing aircraft, where technology, lightweight materials, hydrogen fuel, engines that are optimized, possibly electric engines driven by a hydrogen powered generator. Lots of very clever stuff to come, but all require um, an aluminium alloy, a metal and a, man, a method of manufacture that allows you to store liquid hydrogen safely. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions, just let me know.